Check, check. One, two, three. Was I supposed to hear it on there and not? Oh. So we got to enunciate? Hey, you guys, do you think we should move that tower on that thing, or is that good for you guys? Because it looks like you're all plugged up. Hmm? That's all right. All right. Oh, hey, I want to make sure you're facing that way. Right? There you go. All Yeah, yeah. Well, um, welcome everybody to the Green Program's capstone presentations. Um, thank you to everyone that's here joining us in person at Midgard Adventure in Kvalsvotler, Iceland. Um, and also thank you to everyone that's uh, able to join us online to um, support and learn from these wonderful uh, Green Program students, or Greenies as we call them, um, of all the kind of knowledge that they've gathered. So over the last eight days, uh, these Greenies have been in Iceland learning about clean energy innovation and sustainability. Um, and the Green Program Capstone Project puts all of that knowledge and um, education that they've learned over the last eight days to the test, um, focusing on an entrepreneurial solution to a clean energy or sustainability challenge. Um, so today you'll see presentations from three groups of very, very well, uh, well-rounded and smart students uh, that will, I'm sure, wow you with their um, capstone presentations. So without further ado, I will uh, leave the floor to the first group and let them introduce themselves. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and our esteemed panel who's uh, watching us virtually. Uh, to my right, I have uh, Will Weston, Shane Beltran, I have uh, Fabian Conchola, Frank, and last but not least, we have uh, uh, Jesse Dava. Sorry, Frankie. Uh, Frankie Baba, uh, Barba, sorry. Uh, today, we will be discussing uh, forest management, bioethanol, and decarbonizing heating in the homes. So first, we're gonna start out with the golden circle. Our main goal with this project is to help reduce the emissions used when heating homes in California. Our plan is to use the vegetative byproduct that comes from forest management to create bioethanol, a renewable source of energy and a clean one, to provide heat to homes. Next, we're doing this to help reduce the risk of extreme wildfires while also providing a clean and renewable way to heat communities in affected areas.
Good afternoon. Uh, it is now incumbent upon me to address uh, forest management, which is an integral part of our plan. And uh, with that in mind, I would like to introduce this quote from California Governor Gavin Newsom, and it reads as follows. We recognize that we've got to do more in active forest management, vegetation management. And uh, going along with that quote, I have uh, contemporary, contemporary examples of California wildfires. Now, some California forests were tended to via fuel reduction, logging, and fire prevention methods. However, these did not uh, respond as positively as the officials had hoped. Uh, for example, the Dixie Fire, which occurred in 2021, it ravaged over 950,000 acres of California land. And in part, experts blamed a lack of attention to high tree densities for this occurring. Similarly, uh, the Camp Fire, which occurred two years prior to the Dixie Fire, this was California's largest and costliest wildfire in the state's history. And again, we have this, this theme of high tree densities um, being deemed a major factor uh, in causing the wildfire. And here on the screen, uh, you see this figure, 16.5 billion US dollars. This is the estimated cost of damages incurred, or in, excuse me, incurred by the campfire. And this really drives home just how, uh, how uh, costly it can be economically. And we obviously know the, the cost that um, these fires can have on, on the environment as well. And this leads us to construction considerations that must be made. Uh, now, campfire, campfire's aftermath prompted experts to evaluate whether houses should be rebuilt if they burn down in a high-density environment. And uh, a potential solution that experts have offered is to adequately mitigate the fire risk uh, by clearing enough vegetation before rebuilding, uh, rebuilding structures. And this will also yield biofuel. All right, so um, next, uh, I just want to provide a bit of information about uh, biofuel. I'm going to uh, provide a brief, brief uh, description and the uh, benefits of using biofuel, since it's, this is going to be the method uh, for heating homes. So first, uh, biofuel is a type of heating oil. Heat heating oil that's manufactured from various types of plants and other organic materials. Now these organic materials could be soybeans, corn, um, bio waste, and uh, even algae. Those materials are, are used for, to, uh, for biofuel. Biofuel material can be replenished readily. It is considered to be a source of renewable energy, unlike fossil fuels. Uh, so it's it's more convenient uh, use uh, to, to heat homes because it, it doesn't it's more of it's widely available um, in the US uh, biofuel is commonly advocated as a cost-effective and environmentally friendly alternative to petroleum and other fossil fuels and uh, ob obviously this contribute contributes to the environment as it, uh, it, it as it reduces the uh, emissions of carbon dioxide so next I am going to move to uh, Bioethanol production. So the liquid biofuel in greatest production is ethanol, uh, which is made by fermenting fermenting starch or sugar. Bioethanol is a type of alcohol that is obtained from different types of plants rich in cellulose. Now, one of the benefits of uh, bioethanol is that it produces fewer greenhouse gases during both the manufacturing and burning process when compared to fossil fuels. Uh, bioethanol also can be produced domestically uh, from local resources, and this has the potential to increase local revenue and create additional jobs in the area. So, gonna move on to the uh, cost of bioethanol. Now, as you can see uh, here on the chart, uh, ethanol, the, the price of ethanol is only 2.77 a gallon, so it's a, a lower price compared uh, to the others. Um, bioethanol is one of the most cost-effective fuels when it comes to heating homes. The average bioethanol fireplace costs 
anywhere from $700 to $1,400. This is significantly less than most gas, wood, and electric fireplaces. The cost per gallon of bioethanol is used uh, use is decreased at a steady a steady rate and is one of the cheapest way ways to heat your home. So I'll continue. All right, thank you. So now that you understand uh, how the technology works, how ethanol works, it's important to get an idea of how we're going to implement this, how a project actually looks like. So to put into perspective, there are about 30.9 million acres in the state of California located within a fire hazard severity zone. So these zones are areas within the state of California specifically identified because they have high susceptibility to wildfires. And as you can see, as you can see to, to your left, right to my left, right here, that is the, the 2022 fire hazard severity map by the state of California. And about 13% of all these zones are within very high fire severity zones. So these are the most likely to catch fire. And then you see the 32% is in high and the remaining 55% is within modern. So moderate, so what the point of this map is because it helps us identify potential target sites or project location sites, and it, it helps us better implement or utilize our resources effectively. So, so as you can see there, we developed a project cycle to help us implement the, these projects. So it's divided into six phases. So the first phase would be planning. And what does the planning phase entail? It entails First of all, identifying a potential site. Once we identify the site, we can move on to actually mapping out the area, what's the topography of the area, how, what dangers can we expect. And from there, from planning, then we identify an exact project scope. So where, where will the project end and where will it start, or where will it start? And so once you do that, once you have an effective plan, you move on to the outreach. So this. This outreach is, I would consider, the second most important because we're the, these areas are within a local community and it's important to get feedback from this community. So you have to notify stakeholders, local governments, state governments, federal governments, nonprofit organizations, anyone in general. And you do this by, per, by attending community events such as farmers markets, local fairs, or you do public hearing notices from the local government all the way up to the state governments. And you also put out newsletters as well in the newspaper and then in the news anywhere that they get that the local public get their media. And then once you once you develop that outreach and attain any comments from the public, you can move on to the third phase, which is the environmental phase. And this is the most important and most time consuming. Why? Because as you can see, there's you saw on the previous slide, 30.9 million acres. And there's a lot of biodiversity in those areas. You can have different endangered species in that areas, and it's important to effectively research that. So you need biologists conducting research on what species, what animal species, what endangered species are in those sites. And it helps us effectively mitigate these. So we will be compliant with the California Environmental Quality Act. So they will be reviewing it, and only after a successful re review from stakeholders and the state, we can move on to the next phase, which is mobilization. And what mobilization entails is we gather a lot of the tools, equipment, and train our job force to collect the biomass, and then we move it on to production to produce the, the methanol, and then distribution to sell it. And overall, this, this entire cycle of the project can be within just over 15 months at the least, and all the way up to 25 and a half months at the latest. But then again, it, this all depends on the project site, project scope, and how much, essentially, what environmental factors we determine. So to further expand on Francisco's points, we have our business model, which represents how we plan to accomplish our goals. This starts with attaining cooperation with our stakeholders, the federal, local, and state government, along with the California State Board of Forestry and Fire Protection, 
We then will begin to create awareness for our project through social media and community workshops. Next, we can start assessing locations that are suitable for forest management and collecting our key resources of vegetative byproduct. So our revenue will initially come from government grants and then hopefully down the line when we start to make profit from the sale of bioethanol, it will come from that as well. With any surplus, we plan to reinvest into the company and into biofuel research to hopefully make it more efficient. And then we go into the impact. So we'll measure this by measuring the number of homes that are fueled from biofuel and the amount of money that we are generating. And the incentive, the incentive for this is that customers, they'll be able to get renewable energy, clean energy. They'll be helping the environment. And it's relatively cheap compared to other options, especially with uh, incoming carbon taxes. And then we go into, uh, finally, our cost structure. Uh, in the beginning, we'll start with environmental compliance, making sure we conform to any environmental policies that are in place, just like Francisco was saying. And then we have to fund the labor to manage the forests and to create the bioethanol, and then producing the fuel itself. And uh, finally, we have to look into installation. Uh, bioethanol, it requires a uh, bioethanol fireplace that is necessary for burning the ethanol. And so that will either uh, come from us or uh, out of the homeowner's pocket. Uh, thank you, Will. So moving on and, and pretty much closing out for this uh, presentation uh, this, e this afternoon, I'd like to talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, also known as the SDGs, and how some of these goals are applied into uh, this project that we've done. Starting off with number seven, affordable and clean energy. Eight, decent work and economic growth. Nine, industry in innovation and infrastructure. 12, response, uh, consumption, and production. 13, climate action. And 15, life on land. So to dive more into uh, these goals, uh, the main drivers behind the bio f uh, biofuels are uh, one, energy supply security and reduction in fossil oil use. These can be applied to the um, SDG um, 7 uh, for clear energy. Two, support of uh, rural er areas uh, through technology development and new jobs based on technology. And this can be applied to the SDG goals of uh, eight and nine. Three, uh, mitigation of global greenhouse gases. This is also known as the GHG, emissions and uh, reduction of uh, particulate uh, materials that are toxic for humans, animals, plants, um, and this falls into, again, coming back to the SDG uh, 7. And therefore, uh, biofuels can contribute towards the responsible use of uh, energies and the replacements of a fraction of fo uh, fossil fuels by one of the available green um, renewable sources. Um, coming down to the SDG 12, uh, forest management is going to happen anyways, and the byproduct of biomass is going to go unused. Uh, but with our project that we've come up with, uh, we use this product in a sustainable way. Um, SDG 13, uh, we will be using uh, a clean and renewable energy that could potentially replace non-renewable energy stoves. And finally, SDG 15, this aims to protect, restore, and promote sustainable uh, use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, and could halt and reverse land uh, degra degradation. Next stage. And finally, these are our resources that we've came up with. Thank you, folks. Uh, I am Homeland Security Lecturer at San Diego State, Luis Arriola, and we hope you've enjoyed our presentation, and we will now open it up for any uh, questions.
Yes, sir, I do believe it is. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So the bioethanol production that we're doing, what was that? Oh, uh, so the question was, uh, is this feasible in different types of climate with different types of plant matter? And the answer is yes. The type of bioethanol production that we will be doing is, uh, it takes the cellulose in different plants, and yes, uh, different plants do have different amounts, but it all varies around the same uh, amount. So. Uh, let's say in other areas of the Pacific Northwest or even uh, Canada where they have a lot of forest fires, this would definitely be uh, an option if they were to go through the route of forest management. So the way the California environmental, oh, sorry. So if your your question was regarding how we're going to comply with different Indian or sanctuary environments within the location areas, so part of the California Environmental Quality Act, or if you've heard it before, it's called CEQA. It entails an initial study review. So there are about 22 different sections within that initial study. And a lot of them identify transportation, cultural issues, environmental, endangered species. So all of those, like that specific question, is part of that environmental study. So a project cannot continue or it will not get approved unless all of them are effectively result or mitigated, which is an, uh, provide an alternative to, to prevent any negative impact to it. So in the case, in cases where it's a uh, protected environment or sanctuary, those zones will be off limits. They're already off limits by the federal government and the state government, so we'll, protect, we'll focus our efforts on the exterior to prevent any, any wildfires from actually jumping into those zones. Um, so the question was, how do we promote the use of bioethanol and how do we prevent any, or how will we deal with the pushback from it? And so our initial plan is to promote it uh, through social media, community workshops, uh, hopefully through the local government to get the word uh, out. And then I do believe that there will be some pushback. We will have to tr transition into uh, bioethanol fireplaces, which although are cheap to install, most people already have uh, a fireplace that they enjoy. So um, I think that we're going to have to maybe uh, start to uh, hand out these fire these fireplaces, not hand out, but like help people afford it through uh, like uh, tax breaks. Uh, and especially with increased costs of natural gas and oil, that's going to be super expensive. So most people will probably want to look for cheaper alternatives for the future, especially if uh, a single installation now means over the long term uh, less money from continual use of that fireplace. So to repeat your question, it's what do we see as the largest challenge to implement this project? So I, uh, we've identified two different challenges. So the first one is obviously the environmental challenge. 
there's as you saw three thirty point nine million acres of forest land in the state of California, and those are there are very diverse forest areas which with different species in each one and a different diverse ecosystem. So the one of the challenges would be trying to identify and figure out the perfect locations for that and the environmental phase. But even so, the, the greater one challenge would be having people to get on board with the idea. So as the state of California is transitioning into a more greener state, they, they already offer tax credits for EV cars, tax credit for pellet stoves. So they, and they are constantly looking at this and there are already ethanol companies within the state of California that utilize, they don't utilize forests the biomass from forest forest management, but they utilize other sources from crops. So this this could be an easy transition into that. And as as we saw with Iceland in the presentations last week, Iceland they transitioned to renewable energy as they saw the crude oil prices and other non renewable energies prices skyrocket. And this this forced people to change into renewable sources to be self sustained. So. That's, that's essentially what California is hoping to do, and that's what the current governor, past governors, and also future governors are planning to do as well. Hi, I'm Talon. I'm Elena. I'm Kate. I'm Anna. I'm Sophia. And our capstone project today is on solar paint. Why are we doing solar paint specifically? Uh, this is because we want to expand the use of solar energy in living communities that are located in cities to help promote the use of solar energy in the transition to a sustainable energy production. We plan on expanding solar energy through integrating solar paint into pre-existing structures. We'll be focusing on adding this paint to roofs and the sides of buildings. So we want to expand access to solar energy through solar paint. There are three types of solar paint that are currently in the very early stages of development. The technology on how to store the generated energy is still unknown. Because of this, we do not yet know which one will end up being the most efficient or the best to use in large-scale production. But the first being that being said, the first type of solar paint is quantum dot solar paint, also known as photovoltaic solar paint. The quantum dot cells use nanoparticles um, that are so small they could be mixed into a colloidal paint. Um, and they also allow for a greater light absorption spectrum, which includes infrared light rays on top of visible light, which could lead to higher efficiency than solar panels. So the second type of solar paint is perovskites, which are made up of perovskite crystals, which can conduct electricity when hit by light. These crystals are essentially a substitution for silicone and conventional solar panels. Perovskite solar panels have been developed and are nearly as efficient as conventional silicone solar panels, but they also have a lot of potential as a solar paint because they can be made in a liquid form. 
the University of Sheffield, the National Renewable Energy Lab, and the Clean Energy Institute at the University of Washington are all conducting research on perovskites. Um, they can be made cheaply and quickly and have a lot of different applications since they can be a liquid or a paint. And the third type of solar paint that we will be discussing is hydrogen producing, and this was first developed at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Um, this is more of a paint that will convert moisture into a hydrogen fuel by, support, by splitting the hydrogen from the oxygen, but this is more of an option for a fuel rather than direct solar panels or solar energy, so even though it is a thing, we are, we're just mentioning it. So then there are a few sustainable development goals that solar paint can meet. So solar energy in general would be a sustainable alternative in communities as well as a much cleaner source of energy. Um, and then the goal is to also make it more cost effective and more accessible to homeowners. This product is also a newer piece of technology and a more innovative way to think about harnessing energy from the sun. And then this can help communities within certain states reach their goals of becoming more sustainable and incorporate a renewable energy approach, such as California, where there are laws mandating solar panels on new houses. And then for our sustainability complex, um, what we are focusing on cities, um, mainly like the roofs and walls of homes and communities like within the city, so like more of the urban area. And once this paint is further developed, it can be used on a wider scale, like in more levels of the complex. Um, but individually, like, it can be used on houses, and once it's developed more, like, different types of houses, or, like, paint on the walls, the shingles on the ceilings, or, like, the windows, or it could be used at the state level, even, like, once it's further developed, um, in, like, California, where it's, like, become, it, it's becoming a law that they have to have, um, solar panels, and this would be the cheaper, easier solution, because it can be applied to not only like newer constructed houses, but also houses that have been uh, established and built like a while ago. We will now be discussing our business canvas model. This will explain the environmental and ethical considerations of expanding solar paint use. So now to look at some of the key resources for developing solar paint. First, uh, financial resources, so funding for research is really important as these paints are still being worked on and are relatively new. Um, additionally, we need, to, we need money for manufacturing and obtaining the materials to make the solar paint itself. We also need a lab, which includes equipment and lab technicians to further develop the paint and make improvements to it. Uh, the last key resource involves, uh, cons <coughs> involved, um, concerns the actual production of the paint, so that includes a factory or other physical facilities, uh, the raw materials of the paint, and a workforce. Doing an analysis of our partners and stakeholders is extremely important because we want to have as many po positive relationships in our market as possible in order to spread our product. Just to name a few, um, we need to reach out to city and urban planners along with building companies in order to get our paint into new construction. We hope to partner with city or state governments who may already have a Clean Energy Act similar to California's Solar Act in order to integrate our product into communities and cities with their support. Another goal of ours would be to partner with already existing solar panel companies to promote solar energy as a whole and have less competition in the solar market. There are a few activities that are vital to the success of our product. First, we need to scale up the creation of solar paint so that we can sell it for commercial use. Advertising and education are another are also important because the public often does not trust new technologies they've not heard of. Knowledge about our paint and the environmental benefits will help it make its widespread integration more successful. We will also be encouraging other companies outside of the city level to use solar paint in their products. And then the format of this intervention would be a physical product, which is solar paint, and that can be applied to the sides and roofs of housing. We hope to reach out to our customers through trade shows for building suppliers and paint manufacturers in order to get our products into those who will be dealing directly with new construction. Um, and we want to approach governments directly and hold public meetings throughout the development process to take our the public opinions and concerns into our account. We will also have a website and social media pages to promote our product and raise awareness about solar power. And then how will we actually generate revenue? So this involves donations from people as well as any research grants that are allocated. 
um, and then sponsorships from companies, products, or universities, um, and then any sales that we receive from actually selling our product. Um, and then finally, investments from partnerships with other companies, so that could be existing solar panel companies or solar energy companies, as well as paint companies. So now to look at the beneficiaries or the people who will benefit from solar paint. So first off, we have building companies and contractors. Um, by offering a new and different product, they would set themselves apart from their competitors, um, allowing them to increase sales and hopefully make more money. Um, so then we have homeowners. Solar is less costly than other forms of energy, and solar paint will likely be less expensive than current solar panels. So using solar paint will help, home will help homeowners to save money on electricity in the future. Um, Next up, we have communities. Having access to clean energy that does not produce um, CO2 or pollutants can greatly improve the immediate environment. A town or city that is mostly using solar power would not face as much of the immediate impacts of fossil fuels, such as air and water pollution. Additionally, using solar paint facilitates a transition to using renewable and eco-friendly energy, helping to slow climate change. Um, and now on to who will pay. So we have universities who will primarily fund the research. They would also pay for the facility and different lab materials and technology. Um, we also have local government. They would help to find any projects taken on by city planners, companies that work closely with the local government or larger scale projects within a city or town that require more coordination. Um, we also have building companies and contractors again. They could potentially spend more money on the development of the products that they themselves are using since some experimentation may be needed to figure out how to integrate solar paint into their existing paints, siding, and roofing materials. Um, we also have homeowners again, because homeowners may have to pay more for the services of a contracting company that uses solar paint. Um, solar paint may pose a larger upfront cost to the consumer, especially since it's new and not yet found everywhere. Yet prices may decrease as the product gets more popular. The lower cost of energy after your installation may help to decrease the burden that is the higher initial cost. Uh, making this type of energy more affordable for, pe for people to purchase. All right, and what will it cost to create and manufacture solar paint? So first of all, we will need to invest more money into further research and development to better the paint in the first place. And then it'll also cost money to buy the proper supplies to create the paint. And then the manufacturing facility of where the paint will be created is also a cost for us. And then we also will have a full staff that we will need to pay in order for them to actually come and show up to work. So first of all, there will be factory workers working with the machines to create the paint, and then the managers will help run the factory and manage the factory workers to help them work smoothly and efficiently. And then there's gonna be the sales team filled with um, salespeople and marketers, and they're needed to help promote the product and spread awareness of the new technology that we have created, or not created, but helped further the research. And then we will also have um, a team of research and development engineers and they will help um, develop the paint even more and uh, continue to improve it to be its best self and then lab technicians to continue testing the paint to improve upon it before sending it to manufacturing. So with our surplus we want to reinvest in ourselves. Uh, we will expand the production of our product and hopefully increase production uh, efficiency and our product efficiency. Uh, and we will also use our surplus to go into marketing in terms of advertising and educating others about our technology. We also have philanthropic goals. We want to be able to provide solar paint to communities that do not have the financial ability to invest in solar power on their own. Solar paint provides value by allowing more people access to clean energy. Additionally, it lowers dependency on finite and pollutant producing resources through lowering costs and providing more ways to integrate solar energy into cities. So the next part of this is looking at how we can measure the value and quality of the solar paint and how it performed. So the first thing we can look at is the quantity of solar paint purchase. This would include the amount of solar paint that a construction company buys from a manufacturer, um, the popularity of solar um, products in comparison to normal products when it comes to what consumers purchase from these companies. Additionally, we could look at the amount of solar paint purchased by homeowners and citizens themselves when solar paints become more widespread and show up in stores. Um, we can also look at the increases in solar energy use. This could be seen by looking at the grid and the breakdown of energy uses by sources. Um, an increase in solar energy would point towards the solar paints having a positive impact. 
Um, this would mean that we were able to expand the use of solar energy, which was one of our initial goals. Um, we could also look at the cost of energy. A lower cost would, looking at how much consumers are spending on energy annually in comparison to how much they would be paying for fossil fuel-based energy. Um, this would also mean we accomplished our goal of making solar energy more affordable and therefore more accessible to more people. Um, we could also look at decreases in non-renewable energy use. This is connected to an increase in solar energy use, um, but this could be seen in a decrease in air and water pollution in the immediate vicinity. Um, there is obviously a big difference between air quality in a town by a coal burning power plant and one by a solar array. Additionally, decreasing CO2 emissions and global warming are a major reason why we would want to develop this product in the first place and would be a result of using renewable energy such as solar. And then what do we want our customers to get out of our innovation? We want to help lower the cost of energy by producing a cheaper option to solar panels. We want our customers to be more environmentally cautious and with the use of solar paint in their homes, they will be able to do so easily and for less money. Uh, this will be helpful in reducing pollution since no harmful chemicals are being produced from the solar paint. And um, this will also in turn create less reliability on fossil fuels and more on renewable energy to help create less pollution and cleaner air. We hope that through the use of solar paint, solar energy will become more accessible to communities. In the future, we hope to develop this paint to be used on cars, lampposts, and potentially even roads or sidewalks. Using solar paint over solar panels will have less of a direct effect on wildlife communities due to the amount of space that solar farms require. And unlike the production of solar panels, there will not be a requirement for specific training for manufacturing or applying the paint. And we hope that in the future, solar paint will be a cheaper and more efficient way to use solar power. So now the question is, with everything that we just presented, would this actually work? And would it be feasible? Um, so there's still a lot of uncertainty around solar paint because it's still in the very early stages of research and development. So we can't be certain about which types of solar paint um, would be the cheapest or the most effective. Um, and there are a lot of things we can take into consideration during the further development of this product to ensure its success. Um, so this would involve looking at any environmental concerns. Because this is being painted on the outside of buildings, um, it can endure a different um, types of weather, including rain. So making sure that the ero erosion of the paint or anything similar to that won't be harmful to wildlife or waterways. Um, and then also looking at how efficient each type of solar paint is can help us identify which one would be the best in different environments um, and then possibly being better or more efficient than current solar energy. And then making sure when we scale up this project product um, for commercial use, making sure that it's cost effective, efficient, um, and that the use of resources are managed in a sustainable manner. Um, and then being able to access the energy that is harnessed from solar paint is still something that's in question. Um, most likely it would go to some sort of battery that can enter it into the energy grid. And then finally, looking at how long this product lasts and how well it holds up in different climates, um, and then understanding the reapplications that would be necessary. Any questions? Okay, so I did actually do some research on this. <laughs> and um, basically how, repeating the question is basically um, how like, sorry, <laughs> um, how like the paint would also absorb heat almost and like the temperature inside the homes. So um, the paint is absorbing the heat. So it would in turn create cooler, like less um, air conditioning costs, making the house cooler. So that's another way that it's cheap making um, the living cheaper and better almost. So it does absorb heat and lowers the cost of the air conditioning needed. About, I wanna say from the source that I found, it was about like 
percent maybe that's at least like what one of the researchers was saying So the question is whether there'll be any incentives for the existing homeowners to put the paint on their houses since they don't need to add solar panels. But for our goal, we were hoping to make the paint easy, easily accessed and uh, through having it like be inexpensive. And it's, it's supposed to lower the energy cost. So that's kind of the incentive within itself. So it's gonna be like cheap to buy and apply. And then in the future, it'll be good because the energy bills are lower for these individuals. Do you have any idea where your average rate is and how close you are to the uh, cost of living of the people that live in your neighborhood? Okay. Um, so the question was, uh, do we know like how far along we are with solar paint and how much more it would take to get it to mass production or actual use. Um, um, it's very early. People have, um, there have been researchers at three separate colleges for the three different um, types of paint. Um, and they've, they've developed it and they've, you know, they figured out how it absorbs the sunlight. Um, but yeah, we're still pretty far away. A lot needs to go into the development to figure out how to use it on a wider scale. Um, I know earlier we were talking about like different colors of it potentially um, and so like there, there's a lot there's there the short answer is we don't know there's a lot that needs to go into it um, to make this technology actually feasible. I can just make a guess. Um, oh, how w the question was, um, like, as the solar paint absorbs and harnesses the energy from the sun, like, how it actually transmit it, transmits it um, into, like, wires or batteries or something. I would assume that because it's a paint, um, all of the energy is harnessed within, like, even if it's the quantum dot cells, um, the paint kind of acts as a medium for it all to travel. So I would assume like maybe it just goes to a single source, um, somehow leads there, um, maybe through wires eventually or to like a battery that it can maybe charge or that battery can translocate it somewhere else, maybe. I don't know. So in school, I actually watched a documentary just about, oh, the question was what piqued our interest in solar. Um, so in school, I actually watched a documentary just about climate change. I actually watched it twice in two different classes, in two different years at school, which is kind of funny. And they mentioned just a bunch of creative climate solutions. One of them was the perovskite solar paint. I just thought that was super interesting, especially because it could potentially be everywhere producing energy which we thought was really cool because there's a lot of limitations now on how much we could use renewable energy just because of space and like habitat loss and everything. So we thought it was cool that it could be everywhere. So, yeah. I would assume a sealant could go over the top. Oh, the question is, um, like with the environmental concerns, because it's a paint, could that um, 
like chip off um, and then cause more environmental concerns. I would assume there would be some sort of sealant that could be put over to kind of prevent and protect it. Um, and a lot of the stuff we were looking at actually involves either like chemicals or like the components of it are what's already used in paint today. Um, so what you would already see on houses. So um, if those are already, I guess, approved, um, this would probably fall into the similar area of that. Oh, and then, I mean, even further along, um, I when we were looking at solar paint, I found um, one article that was talking about like a solar sealant for solar panels when, because with the quantum dot, it allows t absorption for infrared rays. And there was a sol like solar panel coating that you could put on already existing solar panels that would also allow for like the absorption of those infrared rays. So even hopefully, you know, maybe even like eventually we could make sealants that are even further advancing the efficiency and the absorption power of the solar paint. So the question is, um, so a lot of building material is reused, um, like say a building is no longer, or is being like taken down. Um, how would it work with this application on top of that material? Um, I don't know the exact answer. I'm not exactly sure how that recycling process works. Um, meaning like if it's like completely broken down and remade into something like, I don't know, wood into like plywood. Um, yeah, I don't know the exact <laughs> answer <laughs> that could change the properties. That's definitely possible because it can absorb the energy. Um, and I don't know, kind of with the environmental concerns, like we don't know if it's harmful, if it's like broken down or something. So um, yeah, I can't answer that for sure. I mean, I think, you know, oh, yeah, um, it, the question was, um, what do we see as, like, our biggest challenges in terms of, like, research and development and rolling out this paint into, like, larger scales? Um, uh, personally, I think it would be um, public support, um, just because it's an unknown technology and people are typically afraid or, like, wary of things that they don't know of. Um, so, I mean... I don't know if you guys have the same opinions or not, but I mean, I think educating the public is something that's going to be really hard because def there's definitely going to be a group of people who are set in their ways. Like I I rely on good old like coal and oil, um, but I think there hopefully would be a good enough percentage of the population interested in learning about solar paint. So like a lot of people, like solar panels, like a lot of people are wanting to go greener with their lives and like with their houses and with their energy use so I think solar paint would be like that almost perfect like way to make it easily accessible or more easily accessible and like cheaper and better for like everyone m more or less to like actually put that get that next step forward to actually living that greener life that they wanted for themselves.
Good afternoon, and good afternoon to everyone who joined the live stream as well. Um, my name is Alexa Fields. This is Hargoon Carr, Jessica Kaiser, Sydney Marshock, and Julianne Beck. And our capstone project is going to be on hydropower in wastewater facilities. So the outline for our presentation would be that first we will discuss the golden circle, the how, what, and why part of our project, then the business model, and then sustainability complex, and lastly, the sustainable development goals. So why? Why do we want to incorporate hydropower into wastewater treatment system? Some benefits of using hydropower can be relying more on renewable energy sources that can help in having replenishable or abundant amount of energy and to meet the electricity demands, to have low cost energy in the long term, to have reduced CO2 emissions, have reduced pollution, which will improve public health, and for economic development in the aspect of creating more green jobs. So just to share some statistics, um, you can see that we are currently heavily dependent on the non-renewable energy such as coal, oil, and gas. One of our main focus of this project is to promote renewable energy, in this case, hydropower. Investing in green energy will diversify energy portfolio and allow us to focus on the sustainable goals. So currently, the wastewater treatment is very expensive. And just to transport or treat wastewater system is set to consume 3 to 5% of the country's energy consumption per year. Some of the benefits of this would be to produce energy without water diversion or making dams, which definitely interferes with the interaction of the rivers and biodiversity. The other important benefit would be that the wastewater treatment plant would become self-sustaining and the energy can be generated whenever needed. So as stated before, the what of our model is utilizing existing wastewater to create hydropower. And this technology is already being used in a few countries, but widespread use has been limited by lack of technology and space surrounding small hydropower. So these are two proposed simplified models for how adding hydropower to existing wastewater treatment plants would look. And this includes an upstream model and a downstream model. So in the upstream model, we would be taking sewage from municipal sources, running it through a desilting chamber first, and then the wastewater would run through the hydro plant, be treated in the wastewater treatment plant last, and be put into the receiving water body. In the downstream model, the sewage would be taken from municipal sources and treated first, and then the treated water would run through the hydropower plant and go into the receiving water body. So in both situations, what we're doing is we're just adding hydropower plants to existing wastewater treatment plants. Um, as stated, the main benefit of doing this is um, to allow these facilities to work off grid and generate their own energy. So as stated, hydropower and wastewater treatment plants exist in several countries already, um, but the widespread use is limited by technology and space, specifically available head in the wastewater system which is generally below 100 meters. Um, so in existing wastewater treatment plants, there's just not enough drop that the water experiences to create enough energy um, for implementing this to be useful. However, small hydropower usage and technology is increasing, and these are two examples of technology that's being used in small hydropower currently, which includes Pelton turbines and the Archimedes screw. So Pelton turbines are useful for micro hydropower, small hydropower, because they operate on low flow, high head conditions, um, which is perfect for wastewater treatment plants. And the efficiency of these is about 70 to 90%. Um, but the Archimedes screw is technology that has existed to use for pumping water for over 2,000 years, but it is currently being reapplied for hydroelectric technology. So this is kind of like the forefront of um, new technology in this field. It is useful for low head and low flow conditions because it only needs the water to drop about one to five meters to be economically feasible. And it has an efficiency of about 80%. So to go more into the, how this technology works, we have the Pelton turbine on the left. This works by shooting water through multiple jets towards the turbine. Um, and these jets are created by pushing high pressure water, such as water falling from high heads, through the nozzle. 
and the Archimedes screw on the right works by allowing the weight of the water to push the screw blades and send the water from higher to lower elevations. And the reason the Archimedes screw is being favored in small hydropower nowadays um, is because it can operate efficiently on low flow, low head conditions. So the next question is, how are we going to achieve these models and these goals? Um, the main idea is that we want to run wastewater through small turbines to generate electricity, tap into existing resources to generate sustainable energy, and create self-sustaining wastewater treatment facilities. So there was a case study done in Switzerland using the models that we already talked about on the right. Um, this study identified 110 potential sites with a total of 18.7 gigawatt hours per year potential unexplored. After the study was completed, only 19 sites with a total of 9.3 gigawatt hours per year production were considered profitable. However, what we did find um, was the largest potential in different downstream and upstream operations. So for downstream operations, the largest potential is in urban areas with treated water, most likely using the Archimedes screw. In upstream operations, the largest potential is in mountain areas with untreated water using the Peloton turbine. Um, although this study only found 19 out of 110 of these potential sites profitable, the study helped to identify what conditions would be needed for different models to work. Um, this technology is still limited by available space and improving technology, but more studies like this will hopefully allow these models to be utilized on a wider scale. So next we will be looking at the business model components. Within our project, the key resources are going to mainly consist of both government and community support, a wastewater plant where water will be going to and from, a hydropower plant, hydropower technology, which consists of turbines and generators, and staff members, which would consist of operators, construction workers, and consultants. Key activities will begin with finding an appropriate location where our approach can be applied, we will need to receive a government grant as funding and then plan to partner with wastewater plants and engineers. We will then work on the construction of the turbine system within the transportation of our water and will lastly focus on educating wastewater treatment plant staff on the maintenance of this technology. Those involved in this project consist of engineers, local government and the community, wastewater plant operators and the construction company. We will reach our customers through the attendance of wastewater operation conferences, city hall meetings, and participation in local elections. Also, as the implementation of this technology is dependent on government funding, an additional method of distribution of this process is going to be through the government. The cost breakdown of this project will consist of materials for building, technology, such as the microturbines and generators listed before, and staff, which was also listed before, consisting of engineers, construction companies, and consultants. Um, this is a service to the community and the government. This acts as a service to the wastewater treatment plant operators by providing improved efficiency and education on the system and the maintenance of this method. With surplus, surplus profits, we plan to reinvest to improve energy efficiency within our facility. In addition, we plan to locate other appropriate sites for future use and improve our community outreach. Um, when answering the question who we will be helping, the wastewater treatment plant and the government will receive most of the benefits for this technology. The wastewater treatment plant will be our main customer, but the government will also be a customer for this project as the energy produced will be going directly to the wastewater treatment plant instead of coming from the grid. Um, our revenue consists primarily of money that is saved from producing clean energy rather than purchasing the energy from the grid. And our first project will be receiving our funding from the government as um, through a grant, but in future, um, in future projects, we ideally will be able to be profitable so we won't be reliant on um, a government grant. Um, social value that is provided by this project would be that we're meeting our energy demand with a renewable resource. Um, in addition, this would be lower cost because the price is controlled when it's not going through the grid. Um, we can tell if this project has been successful by both collecting data and social outreach to analyze changes in energy usage. 
Um, our customers are able to gain increased freshwater supplies that are retrieved through clean energy, um, as well as less reliance on the grid and an increase in company sustainability if they decide to go with this route. All right, so next we're gonna go over our sustainability complex and we will specifically be operating on the city level. So we aim to improve our cities by improving wastewater treatment facilities while making them a source for renewable energy. Um, wastewater treatment plants would aim to be off the energy grid, supplying enough electricity to sustain their daily operations. And a specific example we found that's actually happening right now is in Canada. So they turned some of their existing wastewater treatment plant outflow pipes coming from Lake Ontario into micro hydropower plants. So the treated water is released from the plant and then flows downstream to run through turbines and that generates electricity. So this one would be an example of the downstream model that we presented earlier. And um, this plant in Canada is producing more than 3000 kilowatt hours of energy each day, which significantly reduces the need for outside energy sources. Um, they also received an award of excellence as a part of the International Federation of Consulting Engineers during the 2021 awards, which allowed them to work on about eight more projects um, focused on the like, green energy. So we do recognize that there's going to be some challenges, obviously, with any new innovations and like pushback on green projects. So some of these we chose to highlight were convincing government and local community of funding and support for the new projects the use of more land and resources to build the hydropower facilities um, onto the already wastewater plants, and then not providing energy outside of our facilities for the energy grid. Um, the energy provided would solely stay in-house to sustain the operations. And then also educating local workforce on green energy job and operations. Um, the education factor could definitely help us reach our sustainable development goals. Okay, so moving on to our last topic, I will be talking about the sustainable development goals. So we chose four that we thought best fit our project, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, sustainable cities and communities, and climate action. So for number six, or clean water and sanitation, we believe our project targets the sustainable management of water and sanitation for all aspect of this SDG through our addition of hydropower. Uh, for number seven, affordable and clean energy, the hydropower offers the affordable and clean energy aspect of this SDG as well as low operational costs and minimal CO2 emissions. For number 11, sustainable cities and communities, our way of connecting with urban development and planning is through our addition of renewable energy or hydropower into already existing wastewater treatment plants in many cities. And our use of hydropower to operate the wastewater treatment plant would create a more resilient and durable city economically, socially, and environmentally. And lastly, number 13, climate action. Our wastewater treatment plant will help in the goal of using already existing technologies to decrease our yearly CO2 emissions. And thank you for listening. Yeah, so the question was, do the hydropower plants and the wastewater treatment plants operate independently? So like if, or together, so like if one were to go down, would it affect the other? Um, I think that all depends on the engineering models. Um, I didn't read anything specifically about that in the models that we were looking at, but the objective is yes, they would operate independently of one another. So hopefully if one were to go down, the other one would still like, if the hydropower facility were to go down, then the wastewater could still be treated. Um, but I can't give you any specifics on that.
What do you mean by load? Okay, so I think the question was, like, would there be an overflow or influx of water, like, to the wastewater in the hydropower facility? Um, so, since we're just already building on to, like, a wastewater plant that's already in operation, there really wouldn't be, like, a another, like, influx of water or, like, a new amount coming in. So, that would just, either depending on, like, the upstream or the downstream model, it would be treated first, like, for... Um, upstream and then it would go through to create energy and then if it was the other model it would be treated after creating energy so there really wouldn't be any like new additions it would just be from municipal sources mm -hmm. oh. um, and then to address the portion of your question asking about um, I think what you had asked kind of was if say it was on its way to get treated like as wastewater um, I suppose we would potentially need some sort of filtration system to remove like waste that would prevent like turbines to spin or something. Um, I'm, I, we would probably need some sort of filtration system just to dispose of that so the water could get through smooth enough. Yeah, so the question was, the examples that we use in the presentation were um, generally focused around really high, highly populated areas, like in Switzerland and Canada. And the question was, if we were to apply this technology for maybe communities that have a smaller population, would there be enough wastewater to generate enough energy for it to be profitable? Um, and I would say this is definitely where like the forefront of innovation on this technology is. Um, the term like micro hydropower or small hydropower is definitely still an expanding field. So um, we're creating more technology and better turbines that will be able to create energy off of um, lo like lower flow conditions. Um, as of right now, I can't give you like a definitive number answer for how that would work, but um, technology like the Archimedes screw that I was speaking about um, will definitely help us transition into smaller communities. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question was um, if the water or sewage was to go through the hydropower plant before being treated, would you have any concerns with, you know, having to clean it more often or shut it down more often than you would have to if the hydropower plant wasn't there? Um, yes, that's definitely a concern with the upstream model. Um, however, there's would likely be a implementation of like a desilting chamber or an area that would get rid of like large things that would block uh, the turbines. Yes. Um, also a big part of one of the like activities of this project is educating like wastewater treatment plant operators um, and just on the maintenance of this. So we most likely would be the one to start it like acquire the grant and then like create it but afterwards um, we would educate them on the maintenance of that if that were to be the case and there were to be issues in it yeah and then one of the other models was also fully treating the water before it runs through the hydropower plant so in that case it would likely not be an issue but again there's there's different models for how this would work um, that are pretty much dependent on like the space that's available
Yeah, so the question was, and you guys can add to this if you want, if you have any of your own ideas, but um, the question was, are there any further applications um, besides wastewater treatment for like micro hydropower technology? And I think that there's a ton of applications. Um, I think that there's a lot of availability in hydropower. Um, hopefully, you know, if, if micro turbines and small hydropower technology um, gets better, then we can, you know, start implementing this anywhere where we're using water, like, you know, when you flush a toilet or um, water runs down your sink, anything like that. That's not like feasible right now, but um, that's definitely like a future goal. Um, I also feel like on a larger scale, we had like thrown out an idea of doing like engineered wetlands. So maybe in the future, like that could definitely have the micro turbines and hydropower. Um, so that is like another option. Um, so the question was, what would be like the main challenges to implementing this in like a second wastewater treatment plan? And I definitely think the largest challenge probably with like any problem or innovation is going to be receiving support and funding from the local community and the government since kind of the kickstart for like the first um, initial plant would have to be through government funding. We definitely need to go to like the um, wastewater treatment plant conferences and local elections, as we discussed earlier, to gain support um, from the community. Um, additionally, from our business model, we're not generating any pr like profit from this. It's more like we're saving money um, from energy that we're not buying directly from the grid. So realistically, it would probably take a while um, to like kind of break even on that and have enough money to open up another plant. Um, but, you know, hopefully if it's economically feasible enough, it would work out. 